Hello friends, I'm Rosie Acosta, your host and guide on this journey to self-discovery and radical love. I've walked a path filled with challenges. Growing up in East LA during the 92 LA riots, it left me searching for meaning, for mentors, for a way to truly understand the purpose of life. But you know what I found? The power of conversation. As a first-gen Mexican-American, these conversations became my compass, offering insight, support, and an endless amount of inspiration. So I decided to create a space where we can share these conversations with you, our community. And that's how the Radically Loved Podcast was born. Join me as we dive into topics like mindfulness, spirituality, self-love, and the keys to overall healthy living. I'm joined by my dear friend, fellow author, producer, and teacher, Tessa Tobar. Hi, I'm Tessa, and I'm grateful to be part of this community because it teaches me so much about what it means to be human. Ever since I was a little one, I was always asking my dad the deeper questions in life. Why are we here? What happens when we are gone? What is the purpose of life? I love this show because I get to ask the questions that cut right to the meaning of life. I've learned that no matter how much we want the path to be clear or straightforward, it rarely is. And that is actually part of the beauty that creates a radically loved life. Please do us a favor, share the episodes you love with your friends and leave us a review. Together, we'll learn how to create a life that's truly, deeply, radically loved. Let's begin. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another <laughs> fantastic episode of <laughs> the Radically Loved Podcast. <laughs> woo woo. Here we are. Oh, I'm so excited I'm for today. I'm so excited. So today's guest is Liz Plosser. She's the editor-in-chief of Women's Health Magazine, a prominent publication focused on health, fitness, and nutrition, and lifestyle for women. She has been so instrumental to shaping the content and the direction of the magazine. She's a women's advocate. She's known for her active presence on social media, which is actually where I found her. And I've been wanting to chat with Liz for a couple of years now since her book, Own Your Morning, came out. So I'm really excited. Tessa, I know you're excited too. Oh, I'm so excited. (laughs) It kind of brings me back to childhood a little bit. I was thinking this morning about how like magazines in my family, my mom never wanted me to have magazines. (gasps) Why? Especially women's magazines. I think she felt it gave me... she's a feminist. Yeah, she was was before her time. Well, you've heard the story before about my mom and (laughs) dad. Um, but yeah, she didn't want me to have a negative body image. And back then it was like all skinny white women in magazines. So So she was trying to she was trying to get you to, you know, just love myself. Just not focus on the external. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Not, I totally get not that. Not compare myself to everyone. Well, I else. had the opposite effect. I had my eighth grade teacher would bring me magazines. Um and it was like my first introduction to fashion because I didn't, I mean, there was no other model for that, right? So yes, it was not very diverse and all of that stuff. But at the same time for me, I think at that age, I just loved the beauty of the clothing. Like I'd never seen clothes like that. I'd never seen a Vogue magazine. I, you know, the... The perfumes, remember the perfume samples? I don't even know if they still do that. Do they still do that? I don't know. I feel inspired to go get a bunch of magazines now. Right. Anyway, with all of that, Tessa, I am so excited to have everybody listen to the conversation we had with Liz. Hello, everybody. We are so excited for our guest today. Liz, I've been following you for so long now, and I have to say that I don't know, maybe because I comment or (laughs) because I always heart your stuff. It's the first thing I see when I log on to Instagram and it always motivates me. Like just watching you, I'm not kidding. It always motivates me to to do something for myself. Not just, oh, I want to go work out. Like I just saw Liz's workout and like, look at her go. I mean, she's doing the job. She's a mom. She's a wife. Like she's doing all of the things. Like I need to 
get my life together, you know? So I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm just really excited to have you on the show because I know our listeners are really going to gain a lot from listening to you and hearing this conversation. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for inviting me and for those kind words. I'm glad my oversharing is, is inspiring you a little bit every day. I would love to start off asking you, Liz, you know, and Rosie preempted this with, you know, you're doing it all. Mother, wife, editor-in-chief of Women's Health Magazine. That's a lot. It's been top of mind for me, especially as a woman and in my 40s and going through a really... Um, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say a health crisis, but I'm going through a big change in my life right now. And I'm hearing as I start to go through this change, all of these other stories from other women are coming up and it's like, we're all facing these unique challenges. We're all trying to prioritize our health. We're all feeling also at the same time, societal pressures, caregiving responsibilities, I was curious from your perspective, how does Women's Health Magazine address these challenges and empower women to make their their own well-being a priority? Oh, I, I love that question. And first, I would just say, number one, thank you for sharing that you're going through a challenge. I think um, when we can say that out loud, it's so helpful and makes others feel less alone because I believe that no matter how polished and put together, it looks on the outside. Every single one of us is going through something. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest lessons um, I've learned over the years is to have more compassion for myself and for every human I meet in the world, because we've all got our stuff. Um, so how does women's health approach that? I would put it this way. We really think of our stories, which are always science-backed and expert-based and rigorously reported and fact-checked, um, as almost a choose-your-own-adventure situation for our readers, whether they find us in the print magazine, on our digital site, social media, or all the other you know, octopus arms that the brand has grown over the years. Um, so the idea is really that hopefully something resonates, you know, as they as our readers find us across those different touch points. And while I would love for people to try everything that we've reported and, you know, taken the time to really dig into and put out there for them, I also recognize that we're really busy and that we're each unique. So everything is going to look a little different in your own life. Um, and so the, the hope is that you, you know, pick up some pieces and tools along the way and keep the things that are really working for you and put aside the ones that aren't. Um, it's not meant for you to do every single thing that we're offering up, but really to choose your own adventure and to sort of be the architect of your own well-being and the, the way that works best in your own personal life. Yeah, I love that so much. And it, it brings to mind just the sort of place that we are in as women and sharing. And it's bringing to mind, Tess and I have talked about this, going back to the the health, I don't, I don't want to say crisis, Tess. It's like, what do we call this? We're having a situation, right? Like we've talked about this on the podcast pretty openly. And I think for for me, what what has been at the, at the forefront of my mind and uh, interest is, you know, talking about women's health specifically with regard to like perimenopause and menopause because for for me right now I'm postmenopausal and I'm 40 right so I I started going through menopause in my mid 30s and at this just a couple of years ago you know just looking for resources and looking for models and you know people out in the world that are, are women that are living with this and, and how do I deal? And it's like, I have all these feelings. I'm having hot flashes. I'm depressed. I've got brain fog. Like all of these things trying to figure out how to approach it in a way that's, that's um, sustainable for me, right? And so I think about all of the the tools and resources that, that are available even, even now, you know, through different websites or online publications and and I feel like our our sort of you know contribution to the 
the community of, of women is, is to be able to talk about these things openly and to be able to discuss, okay, this is how I care for myself. These are the symptoms that I'm having. This is how I'm feeling. Like from your vantage point, how do you see this evolving? And, and I'm speaking specifically from like a perimenopause to menopausal uh, age, because, you know, it, we do get a lot of questions about this since Tessa and I've been talking about it, which I'm so grateful that we started talking about it because we're finding how many women that listen to this podcast are in that, I, I would say like, you know, demographic. So so I'd really love, you know, to hear your perspective on that. I think that our listeners would really love to hear what what you think. Yeah. Well, first I'll just share, I'm about to turn 45. So I I too am particularly interested in this um, topic as I'm going through my own, you know, body changes and hormonal changes. Um, and I think you're right. It's incredible how much specifically the perimenopause and menopause space has changed even in the time period you just described, two years. Um, like so many women's health issues, it was definitely a topic that was sort of like whispered about or, you know, covertly Googled about for so long, um, sort of, you know, the unspoken words in conversation. And then I think a lot of women, once they reach that point in their lives, were like, holy, insert, you know, multiple asterisks, holy moly, like, what is going on? Why did nobody tell me this is what it's like or that this was coming? Um, and now I think we're in a really different place thanks to people like you, Rosie, and you, Tessa, being able to share about it and use your platform to talk about it. But even just seeing, um, you know, the investment that like VC firms have been making in so many startups and technology companies that are trying to help women through this time, um, the plethora of books that have been published on it. It's just a completely different conversation that's happening right now. And I really think when you can shine that light on these topics that for so long have been stigmatized or taboo, that that's like where healing and change happens and women can really feel empowered to find the solutions that are going to work best in their lives. So thank goodness we're talking about it. And I put women's health definitely in that group. Um, and I'm really proud of that. We've always, you know, that's that's really the foundation of the brand is that we we go there, we go and tackle the issues that um, we know that our readers are thinking about and searching for really credible science-backed information on. Um, and we talk about it in a conversational way that's not scary, that's not sterile. Um, and hopefully through that voice and education, women feel more empowered during this time. Um, so thank you for talking about it. I hope you will continue to. Um, and just sort of to piggyback on that, I think that's part of the magic of our brand is that, you know, our editorial team, like when we have brainstorms, our editors come in and because I, I believe we've created a safe place and culture where people can really share what's happening with them personally or what their friends are talking about, that's when our best story ideas are hatched. When our editors get really raw and vulnerable and say, hey, I'm going through this or I know you know, I have a family member who is, and it often turns into our best stories. And that's when it begins when somebody has the courage to say it out loud. Mm. You know, that also, if I could pull on this thread, just one more. She loves to pull deeper. threads. <laughs> I will. So having this kind of conversation. Pull away. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, <laughs> for the support. Um, so, okay. In particular, it, this isn't a surprise for listeners. I've talked ad nauseum about going uh, undergoing surgery in about a week and a half, which is going to put me kind of out of commission for like two months, which is so scary. And I, I want to talk about this from the lens of advocating for myself at home, being the one that does a lot of the heavy lifting, walking the dogs. You know, I mean, I think about gosh, has our culture really changed that much since the 50s when I'm expected to do it all and then some and also work full time? I mean, I haven't had a day off in the last 14 days. And you know what's crazy about that statement is I'm not going to have a day off until I go under the knife for surgery. 
And so preparing for something like that and advocating for myself at home in terms of, hey, everybody else, and I live with two other wonderful human beings <laughs> who happen to both be male. <laughs> so, um, one I'm of them is your husband. Yes, one of them is my husband. But I keep having to have this conversation about, I'm not going to be down for a couple of days. I'm going to be down for weeks. And this means no walking the dogs for a couple of months. And I've had this conversation with other women who are going through the exact same thing. And it's all kind of like the men kind of don't, I hate to say it like this, but honestly, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like, oh yeah, you're going to be down for a couple of days. And we're like, no, this is a weeks long healing process. And you, you're going to have to be with me through that. And I'm going to expect you to be there. So I guess I'm wondering how we have that conversation and advocate for ourselves in our home if we're in that kind of heterosexual relationship where we feel like we've been carrying a huge <laughs> amount of effort for, for many years. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. And all of the feelings you're feeling right now, I can only imagine and also just say, of course, you're scared. Of course, this feels like a lot. And it's going to be a wild change when you complete the surgery and you are on the other side of it um, because you can't, you know, think your way out of it or meditate or stretch or do anything. Like you're just going to have to rest and everybody around you is going to have to pick up the slack. Um, but I think you're doing it exactly right by being curious about how to approach it and talk about it. To be clear, I am not a therapist, so obviously I would um, suggest you speak to a professional as well because these are real big issues and I, um, I'm i just giving Liz advice or how I would approach it in my own life. Um, and I am personally on this journey with you, getting better about using my voice and saying what I need and saying when it's too much. Um, you know, my my relationship is is not perfect. And we, we have our pain points just like any relationship, but I do feel really proud of how my husband and I who've been together since we were 20 years old, how we've really like grown up and grown together, um, and learned a lot of skills, even in the last five years about how to communicate better and give each other what we need. Um, and for me, the biggest piece of that is literally saying it out loud instead of, you know, feeling like I'm doing the majority of the work and then just being resentful and sort of spiraling in that space. You know, the one other thing I guess I would offer is, and maybe either of you can relate to this or, um, or not, I'd be curious, is something that Matt, my husband and I have really worked on over the years. And this is almost a joke, but we call it our workflows, which is such a, a corporate speak word or jargon, <laughs> but we have our different workflows in the family and we're kind of constantly calibrating them. Like one of his workflows is ordering the groceries and making sure that is taken care of. Um, one of my workflows is walking the dog. So if we were to arrive at a situation where, you know, I need to be down and resting for a little while, we would definitely have to have a conversation about, <laughs> you know, the Excel sheet of our lives and our, our all of the, the various workflows that are happening, like what needs to shift? Maybe I would start being the one who got online and ordered, you know, the task rabbit or Wegmans delivery person to bring by the groceries. And obviously Matt would have to, to walk Willa, but in case that's helpful. And again, I am not a therapist, just friend to friend. It has really meaningfully changed our relationship. And I think um, melted away a lot of the resentments that have been building up over the years. Hey there, tech savvy listeners, Rosie here, and I'm thrilled to share with you a game changer in the world of tech accessories. But first, let me drop a little something special your way. Picture this, a sleek, stylish solution to safeguard your devices. Now let's talk about Safe Sleeve, founded by two California engineering grads in 2012. They set out to tackle a pressing issue, EMF radiation exposure risks. And boy, did they deliver. Safe Sleeve isn't just about function. It's about practicality and style all rolled into one. So what's the deal with EMF? Studies left, right, and center have all raised red flags. 
linking exposure to higher rates of cancers in rats, and even leading France to ban iPhone 12 sales due to radiation emissions. But fear not, because Safe Sleeves got your back. For a limited time for the listeners of this podcast, you can get 10% off by using code ROSY10. You can get 10% off of your entire order. Head over to www.safesleevecases.com and use the promo code ROSY10 to get 10% off of your entire order. Now, back to our show. I think all of us together here, we've all been in decades plus relationships. So we absolutely understand, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Tori and I are going to be, uh, are, we're celebrating our 21st anniversary in two weeks. So I, I love the, that you call it the workflow, you know, that, that you have different, you know, <laughs> workflows. And I, I think, I think that, you know, it's, it's great to be able to have that structure. I think, for me, you know, I, I, and it's, this is not mine. I, I, I don't know what brilliant therapist I heard this from, but I remember hearing this to sort of meet your partner where they are and, and to let them know like where you are, you know, like I'm feeling really low right now. I, I need you to pick up, you know, we always say I'm going to do a hundred percent of my 50%. Right. Mm -hmm. He's going to do 100% of his 50%. I'm going to do 100% of my 50%. And sometimes I can't do 100% of my 50%. Sometimes I can only do 25%. And, you know, I, I, in order for us to be able to meet in that space, we have to communicate. But, like, look, you know, everybody, all of us here probably have gone through different growth spurts and also, um, not growing <laughs> spurts in our relationships where, you know, there is a little bit of that growing pains. I know for Tori and I, we, we've gone through some difficult moments and, and even going back to the, the menopause, like he's had to deal with me going through this for the last four years. And, and it's really taxed us, you know, because in the beginning, it's like, am I depressed? Like what's going on? Like I'm just really snippy and I'm just like unhappy. And my work is no longer making me happy. Like, I don't know what's going on, you know? And I'm like, is it my relationship? Am I finally at that space? Is it like, am I with the wrong person? <laughs> you know, and these are conversations that we would have, you know? And, and I'm with you, Liz, like always, we always tell people, you know, if you're ever there, I was working with therapists at the time that it really, really served me. But going back to your point, and I think at the end of the day, it's it's the communication with the people in our lives that that care about us. Tessa, it, it, and I'm just going to piggyback on what you were saying too, the sort of dynamic that you have in your household. I think as women, regardless of how many leaps and bounds we've done, there are still certain things that are kind of expected of us. Even if somebody's not saying it, it's like, for example, Liz, you're you're a mother. Like your children, you know, you birthed your children. Like your children, you know, were, were of you from what from what I understand. And it's like they needed you to survive. <laughs> like not not their dad, right? It's like they needed you to survive, right? So so I think about the things that as women we we do have to carry. Uh, in a way that that can be a lot, and we're also expected to be in the workforce and show up a hundred and ten percent, right? Because we're in this fast paced environment. So I, I do, you know, Tess. I, I would love for you to to add something too, but I also want to ask Liz in, in that same vein, like, how are you able to to find that balance? for yourself. I mean, you have all these roles, but like, how do you find it for you? And I'm asking more of like, you know, if we, we, we can get ethereal or, or spiritual even like, how do you find that, that peace within yourself when, when you have those moments where you're wanting to recharge? Mm. Ah, there's so much in all that you just said. Um, and you know, it's really easy for me to default into just gratitude for how lucky I am for the opportunities for the awesome job that I 
love with all of my heart that I get to wake up and do every day for healthy children, you know, and now I'm truly like turning you guys into my therapist. (laughs) This is what I always say. Like, I don't deserve to complain about how overwhelmed and busy and frenetic I feel. And he will often tell me, well, that's, that's real. This is, you know, it's, um, I think of them as first world problems. And yet I also have to acknowledge that if I don't take care of myself and respect the fact that if I don't slow down or recharge, it's, you know, all going to blow up on me in a not, in a not healthy way. Um, that's not good for me. That's not good for my team. That's not good for my family. Um, I mean, you, probably surmise this since you follow me on Instagram. But for me, um, getting up early and having that quiet time for myself, where I make myself coffee, I cuddle with my dog and take her out for a quick walk, and then hit the gym for a workout. um, That is really that is a recharging time. And I know that might sound strange, since it's, you know, movement, and often I'm, I'm really pushing my body. Um, but I really do get into, you know, a zone, um, and I'm listening to music, whether it's soft or fast paced and I'm, you know, choosing the artist or the playlist I'm listening to. And I'm, I'm getting through my sets and reps and proving to myself that I've kept the promise to myself to get up and get in that workout and, you know, pick up the heavier weight and all of those things cumulatively, um, really give me a sense of calm and clarity and confidence to then head into the world and meet all the challenges and twists and turns that the day has in store for me. Like, honestly, the crazier the day, the more I feel that I need that, that time and that workout. Um, because it, it gives me power. It gives me strength to get through it all. Um, and so while I think it's really fun watching my body change or, you know, flexing a my biceps muscle in the gym at the end of a workout, the reality is that for me, it's 99% about everything else the workout gives me and only 1% about the actual physical exertion. And of course, the longevity benefits and muscle building benefits and bone density benefits and all the other wonderful cascade of healthy chemicals that are happening in my body are wonderful. Um, but it's really gives me an emotional center to step back into real life and show up as the best version of myself I can be. Liz, how, what, I mean, I'm sure. Okay. So we're all human here, right? Ideally, like that is the daily flow for your mornings. You make the most of it, you get up. And I so resonate with what you're saying, because that is my time. That is my spiritual time as well. I get up early. I love to be the first one awake. I know Rosie, you can resonate with this and have my coffee and read my book and just be quiet without anyone needing anything from me is like so essential. And then like you, (laughs) I need to move my body. I need some fresh air. So I go outside, but lately it's been so, so, so hard. And I think as the surgery gets nearer, I'm just getting more and more anxious. So it makes sense to me. Right. And by the way, thank you for the reminder to seek, uh, a therapist because yes, yes, and yes. But my question is, what happens on those mornings, and maybe it's rare for you, um, when you sleep in or you're just like, I can't get out of bed today. Do you, Are you able to, for me, it feels like, oh my gosh, my day is totally off the rails. Everything is just discombobulated. Are you able to get yourself, quote unquote, back on track somehow, if that happens? Oh, I love that question. So a couple of things. I, I kind of have two go-tos when I'm my alarm goes off and I'm like, oh, not feeling it. The first one is um, I remind myself 100% of whatever you've got. That's all you have to give. It doesn't have to be the best workout of your life. You don't have to set a PR today. Kind of reminds me what you said, Rosie, about... Um, a hundred percent of your, your 50%. It's like, <laughs> yeah. well, if you, if you only got half of your 50% done, that was still a hundred percent of whatever you had, as long as you're giving a hundred percent, you know? Um, and that can kind of take some pressure off that, you know, it doesn't have to be this big, incredible workout. It could just be stretching or foam rolling or doing some yoga poses. Um, and the second thing I tell myself is four minutes. 
if you're not feeling it after four minutes, you can walk out and get, you know, throw in the towel. And there's actually some science to the four minute rule, which is, um, that's, I'm going to bungle this, but essentially when you, the way the oxygen and cells are reacting to the physical exertion, it's kind of when your body acclimates because it's really hard for the first four minutes. Like it's, it's unpleasant because your body's going through, it's a little mini trauma to your body. It's stressed out. Um, and nine times out of 10, I feel better after four minutes. We're and I, we're I can't honestly remember ourselves. a time that I didn't keep going. <laughs> yeah. <gasps> a good trauma though. It's good for your trauma. All cortisol is not bad, which you both know. Um, but yes, of course, there are times when even after I remind myself of the four minute rule and a hundred percent of what you got, whatever you got, I still don't want to get up. And, you know, I think Tessa, maybe this will be useful for you because you're not going to be able to move your body in the way you're used to and that you love so soon. And so those are days when we need to find other tools and this is going to be a journey for you. Sorry to keep bringing it back here, but I'm thinking about moments or times in my chapters when I've gone through injuries or surgeries and I've been, you know, I am like, oh my God, what am I going to do without my workout? I'm so dependent on that as a source of mental and emotional health and well-being that it's it's terrifying. So I, I can understand your fear right now. Um, but the cool thing is that, you know, if we're constantly learning and growing and trying new things, there should be other tools in our toolbox. And so I can pick up some of those. Like I can still listen to music on my way into work and kind of, you know, have that. And it's not meditation as much as I try to pretend it is, but it, you know, I'm, I'm setting an energy for myself. Um, I can still have my ritualistic mug of coffee, which brings me great joy, even the smell of it and choosing a mug. Um, so I'm not saying you know, it's exactly the same or I feel exactly as good, but it is nice to know that there are other solutions that it, the, my morning workout, if it, if it's taken away from me, which it has been, I will be okay. I will find a way through. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the, the lesson, isn't it? It's that this one day doesn't define you, you know, and it's okay to have an off day and it doesn't, yeah, and that, you need, and you need yeah. to give yourself a break. Mm -hmm. And, and by the way, just as a meditation and mindfulness teacher, I'm going to say that listening to music is absolutely meditation and it's also mindfulness practice, you know? So, you know, I, I think that a lot of the times people think, I want to just really dispel that myth that the only type of meditation is sitting down and being still and closing your eyes and sitting cross leg. Like we're finding so many studies that show that we can achieve those states in in different ways and mindfulness is also just about you know we we just interviewed Sharon Salzberg who we love and has been a great teacher for us for for many many years and she talks about mindfulness not being easy and it just being a very specific way of paying attention and so if you're specifically paying attention to what you're doing every day you're being mindful. And it's also a form of meditation. And, and meditation, the definition of meditation is just to become familiar with. So I really feel like we sort of utilize, you know, in our minds, we think, oh, if I want it, especially if, if any of us know any type A people in our lives, if any of us know any type A people, we want to do it and we want to be able to do it right. You know, <laughs> I know we're all kind of looking around. We want to do it right. And so this is the one thing that I, I want to continue to encourage people to remind them that, yes, listening to music is a meditation. Going and going for a walk with your dog is a meditation. Being with your family and, and being fully in the present moment is also meditation, you know? So, so yeah, I just wanted to throw that in there for everyone. That's it. <laughs> It's such a great reminder. Thank you, Rosie. Oh, it's so it's so true. I'm leading a teacher training right now and these young young students in terms of not young necessarily 
age-wise, but like young to the practice of meditation and young to the practice of yoga, it's so helpful to remember that it doesn't have to be rigid. We don't have to hold ourselves to this like quote unquote perfect standard. Um, and yeah, we just have so many preconceived notions about what mindfulness is, what meditation is. So that's so, so helpful for all of us to remember. Thank you. So we've been talking a lot about, you know, the stage and age of, of life we're in right now. Um, I think the last question I wanted to make sure I touched on, if it's okay, is going back to age. You know, we're all in that the decade of the 40s. Um, and I'm really enjoying it in many aspects. And also, like I mentioned, ad nauseum, there's a lot that's unknown, uncertain, and there's a lot of emotions coming up for me. So I wanted, I wanted to hear your thoughts on being bold and brave and owning that age. Oh, I am really, really glad you brought this up. And I'm so glad that we're sharing our ages here. You know, it's interesting working in the media space because for so long, and it still happens today, um, so many people, women particularly, are afraid to share their age because of, you know, societal pressures or repercussions. Um, I, you know, without going down a a rabbit hole, I do feel that especially as we reach certain um, thresholds or sort of markers along the way, there, there's the pressures to to get married, to have children, to have reached a certain point in your career, to have done this, to have done that. And, you know, it's, it's hard on women, I think, and we're really trying at women's health and I'm, I'm sort of leading the charge to flip the script and to remind women that, Aging is not a bad thing. It's a beautiful thing. With age comes wisdom, um, that it's, it's not over when you've, you know, you haven't closed a door when you've, you've reached X, Y, or Z age. If anything, new ones are opening with all the, all the knowledge and experience that you've accumulated over your life. And so we are really doing everything we can to showcase women of all different generations. And I mean, you know, from, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, women doing extraordinary things, um, pivoting in their careers, um, you know, getting into strength training for the first time in their lives, um, following a passion that they never believed or thought they could. So there's just so many inspiring examples of that. And and we really want to be a beacon to women that, um, that aging is a powerful, amazing thing and something to, to embrace and, and feel really good about. Um, and I, I hope by sharing my age and that, you know, as I said, I turn 45 next week, I'm gone are the days when, you know, you do your little Instagram post to yourself and you say it's your birthday, but you don't, you you know, like let them wonder how old is, how old am I? And I just started like two years ago, just putting it in like sentence number one, like all caps. This is, this is, this is who I am. This is how old I am. Um, and that feels profoundly empowering to me to just own it, own exactly where I am. And so we're going to keep doing that at women's health. Um, we're always looking for women who move us, you know, to feature them across our platforms. And I love that, um, our audience is really, really here for us showing women in their elder years doing extraordinary things. So um, that's, I think, one example to your question. Yes, cheers, um, Tessa, about being brave and bold and courageous. Um, you know, maybe some people listening think this is no big deal. And I think that's awesome if you've been, you know, you've had this perspective for your whole life. More power to you. That's wonderful. Um, but that might, it might feel uncomfortable for some folks listening and for some readers. And, and we hope to help give them some of that courage and bravery and strength. And so, you know, one example, just for me thinking about kind of the merging of those two ideas, owning your age and, and being, being courageous and in work and in life, taking risks is that, um, one of our, our recent cover stars was Joan McDonald, a 77 year old, woman who has become a, a total influence fit influencer on Instagram. She's like crushing it at the gym, you know, doing deadlifts and 
bench pressing and all these things. And we put her on the cover of Women's Health at the end of last year, 2023. And for me, that was definitely a moment. I've been at the helm of this brand for a little over six years now. You know, that's not something I would have been brave enough to do five years ago or even two years ago, because all the all the historical data would suggest that you you put an A-list celebrity on your cover and that's how you win newsstand sales and that's how you win traffic and that's what the readers want. And, mm. um, you know, part of the, the wonderful thing about the world of media evolving and changing is it's, I feel, given me more freedom to experiment with the brand. Um, but it felt like a big risk. You know, I, I'll be honest, some, some people I work with thought this was crazy. Um, it, it, and I had to really stick to my, stick to my conviction and, and trust my gut that this was, this was a risk worth taking. And do you know what? That cover with Joan was our most liked, shared, the, our most successful cover release of all time in the entire history of the brand. And you all are on social media, so you know this as well as I do. We can't, you know, control the, the trolls and negative comments and sort of the toxicity that can sometimes enter the conversation. But 99.999% of the comments and feedback were just like total love, awe, respect, high-fiving this woman, you know, people of all ages, readers of all ages. That's the great thing about WH. Women are finding us at all ages of their lives. So it for me that was like so much wind you know behind me so much momentum pushing me forward to keep taking those risks and trusting my gut and to do you know these big bold things that um actually can have an incredible impact on our audience that is so this is so inspiring i'm i'm so excited about this and and for me like I, I totally share in, in that sentiment that we should really embrace aging. And I think that for a lot of us, seeing more of those covers is what continues to to fuel that that excitement, you know. So thank you for doing that. I, I did see that and I also did share that. And I, I thought it was just so incredible. I'm like, yes, more of this, please. Like, this is really exciting. You know, for me, it's like growing up in a Hispanic household, you know, we revered the matriarchs in our family. Like they were very revered and very, very respected. And, you know, it it was always like a, a badge of honor to, to age, right? Like there was this, this thing that in, in culturally, it's like the abuelitas, you know, are very revered, you know, they're very sacred. And, I just always remember as as a kid, like, oh, I, I can't wait to be one of them. You know, like I was little and I would ask my grandma, I'd ask my my abuelita, like, when am I going to be like you? Like, when am I going to be, you know, that age? So for me, it, it's been an interesting journey. You know, it's like, I think when you're young, you're like, yeah, I'm 25 or I'm whatever, I turned 30. But the minute that you start to get above 40, it it does start to feel different, you know? And I think for me too, like when, when my, when I went into perimenopause before 40 and, you know, I started to see all the changes and, and everything, I just felt like, wow, like, what does this mean? Am I still a woman? Right? Like, am I still a woman? Because I'm, my body is no longer quote unquote functioning the way it is. Um, but obviously like, of course I am, you know, of course I am still all of the things and I'm still you know, I, I I can still do everything that I do, except from a, a deeper place of understanding. And and now like, I want to talk to other women and I want to be excited about aging. Like, I, I want to get older. I can't wait until I turn 50, like fucking 50. Like, that's going to be so amazing. Like, I want to have a huge party and I want all my friends to come. And, you know, it's like for my 60th birthday. I mean, I, I pray that I live that long, right? But but I love that if we continue to celebrate it and see it outside in the world with you know publications like Women's Health and 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 women that inspire us, like I think we will be able to get there so that we're no longer you know glorifying anti aging, right? Like like let's how do we go mm-hmm. backwards? It's like how do we embrace what we have where we're at? 
yeah. and how we have it, right? How do we embrace the age that we are so we're not trying to fast forward the clock or rewind it backwards, right? So um, I we can chat with you forever. I feel like we just started talking and I, I want to be respectful of your time, but I also want to let everybody know that they if they enjoyed this conversation, which I'm sure everybody did, please get Own Your Morning. And I'm showing it here if you're watching the video on YouTube. Shameless plug. Um, please get this book. I have it on my nightstand. So I look at it every morning and it really just reminds me of the importance of, of setting that time in the morning, how important it is to start your day feeling good and how important it is to set a routine that's sustainable for you, right? Like that routine that's sustainable for yourself. So with all that being said, uh, Liz, thank you so, so much for being here. For the people that are listening to this podcast, where can they reach you or where can they find you or get more information? Thank you so much for having me. I truly could continue talking to you both for hours. So this was this is really fun. Um, yes, please follow me on social media. I am at, at Liz Plosser. That's P-L-O-S-S-E-R. And check out Women's Health on newsstands at womenshealthmag.com. And you can follow us on TikTok and Instagram and all the places at Women's Health Mag. Awesome. Thank you so much. We do have one final question. It'll be a quick one. We ask all of our guests and basically the 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 plot I'm, I'm going to keep changing it cuz i feel like <laughs> after 500 episodes it's always the same thing um the plot of the podcast is how do you create that radically loved life right so the whole intention is that we are radically loved by god source universe universe whatever you want to call it the universe works for us and not against us so the final question to you liz is how do you feel radically loved ooh well i will share that i believe in a higher power i don't understand it and i don't have to um but i i do believe that the the universe is looking out for me and i see that every single day in tiny ways whether it's you know catching sight of my favorite number which is 7 or bumping into a friend that i was just thinking about um all the little coincidences that i think were actually meant to be um and that everything is happening in my life just as it's supposed to even the disappointments uh, and there's so much comfort in knowing that, that mm, I can't control it. Um, will, willpower will only get you so far. This higher power, the universe, whatever word it is in your own life, um, that's what's really taking care of me. And I feel so grateful for that. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Tessa. So thank welcome. you. Thank you that so much, lovely. Liz. You were uh, such a delight. This was such a great conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. For everybody out there listening, if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tune in next week. Hey, friends. Thank you so much for listening to the Radically Love podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps. Also, don't forget to check out the Mindful Love Hub on Substack. This episode was produced by Tessa Tovar, music by DJ Taz Rashid. 